Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, the God of glory and grace in adoration and praise. Your greatness, sovereignty, and all of your attributes remind us that we are creatures, you alone are creator, and we owe you our worship. And we thank you for the absolute privilege it is that we can come together to worship you with the body of Christ. We worship you in the power of the Holy Spirit and by the truth of your word. We are in awe and humble that we can approach you directly because of Christ's atoning work on the cross. And now being in union with him, we become living sacrifices and the temple of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for each member of this church body and may each of us joyfully and lovingly serve and minister differently according to the particular gifts of the Holy Spirit has bestowed unto us. We celebrate your goodness, O Lord, and we praise you for your grace toward us, confessing that we are completely unworthy of such favor. We are overwhelmed when we contemplate our iniquities and failures, knowing we fall short of the righteousness with which we have been covered the righteousness of Christ credited to our account. By your grace, may we continue to grow and mature in Christ, for it is your intention to have a treasured people for yourself. Father, may you be glorified through the preaching of the word this morning. Uphold your faithful son and servant, Pastor Rick. Come be his shepherd now. Protect him. Guard his mind and minister to his heart. Be his anchor. May he always stand firm on the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. As we come to your precious word that is nourishment for our souls, may your Holy Spirit quicken our hearts and illumine our minds so that we will increasingly trust and obey our Lord and Savior. Father, forgive us for the sins we have committed against you this past week instead of trusting the truth of your word, we have followed our sinful hearts that are full of worldly concerns and desires. Forgive us for our, our, for our failure to obey and to seek your will over our own. So Father, keep us fixed on Christ. Keep us fixed on eternity. Keep us fixed on that day of his return and on that coming kingdom and everlasting rest that is ours in him. For we know in Christ there is a far greater place we are destined for. May we meditate on that reality so it manifests in our lives, in our day-to-day -day living. We have nothing to fear. Christ has conquered fear and death. So help us to continue to live in such a way that displays your great work and redemption through Jesus Christ that we will grow into true, mature, faithful Christians who are not impressed by the corrupted, fleeting junk of this world where moth and rust destroy. Because by faith, our hope is in heaven, confident that beyond this world is the true life and true hope that our great, great God builds, which is eternal and incorruptible. May that be our constant focus. May the hope of eternity cause even our worst sufferings to seem like a momentary light affliction compared to what is being stored up for us, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To the delight of at least one person in our church, we are back. <laughs> some of you are smiling, some of you... Uh, no response. <laughs> One of you is pretty happy about it. <laughs> but it's been quite a while yeah, since um, uh, we were going through uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And we are back today. Okay? Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. So please turn your Bibles to Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. 
And please read, al read along as I, I mean, follow along as I read it. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Amen. Let us pray once again. Father, as we are about to receive your good word, which is truth and life and nourishment to our souls, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work in all of us, in our hearts and minds, Lord, both to understand the message and to receive it by faith in you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So until this point in Matthew's account of the, the gospel and, and the story, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the disciples had heard, um, as we all have, going, having gone through 16 chapters of Matthew, many and many public and private teachings of Jesus. They were right there alongside him. They lived with him. They traveled with him. They were part of his ministry. They saw him perform many miracles, many, many healings. And just the recorded healings are just a portion, because not everything is, is recorded. So many, many healings, Jesus walking on water, feeding of the 5,000, etc. So we've gone through many of those, as you recall, right? At least some of you. But what these three particular disciples will witness in this passage on the mountain where they were with Jesus was something that they will not soon forget. Verses 1 and 2, again, after six days, Jesus took, them, took, it, took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. About a week after, so specifically, I mean, you know, Matthew says six days after, Jesus, uh, prior to this time, Jesus uh, told his disciples that he would suffer at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the scribes, and that he would die and be raised. And that one, that came actually right after, uh, you know, Jesus' question to, right, Matthew asking, hey, who do people say that I am, and so forth. And then the, the Peter's, I mean, uh, Matthew's confession came, right? Uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, right? And then, of course, Jesus commended him about saying, you didn't figure that out. Uh, God the Father had revealed that to you. So we see already in chapter 16, uh, hopefully, okay, what, what Jesus was, was doing and what he was sharing and wanted to reveal to his disciples. And so he took, at this time, he took, right, six days later, he took Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain, uh, the name is not recorded here, where they witness this glorious transfiguration of Jesus. Okay. Just as a side note, later on, and we'll come to this point uh, <clears throat> in later, latter part of Matthew, but Jesus would take the same three disciples to Gethsemane the night before he was to be crucified and where he prayed, right? You know the, 
the scene there, and he took the same three disciples there. And he also told them to pray, but he also shared with them the sorrow of what he was about to go through, right? So it was a very, um, yeah, the Bible really doesn't go into the reason why these three, but these three are, are generally known as the inner circle, right? The three closest disciples to Jesus Christ. But let's not, let's not take that as he was, uh, you know, th these three disciples were the three favorites of Jesus because Jesus, uh, get the favoritism as taught in scriptures is sin, right? So Jesus would not have done that. But he had his reasons. Uh, but any, at any rate, uh, they were privileged, uh, to say the least. Right, to be included in these very, very significant moments with Jesus. So on the mountain, Jesus was transfigured. Okay, what does that term mean? Would you understand the term transfigured? It's a different English word, but it's similar to what we looked at and considered before. And I covered this also yesterday for those of you who, who came to MCG. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to, the, to this world, but be transformed, right, by the renewal of your mind. So, similar word, not exactly same, but in the Greek term is the same Greek word. And it is from this Greek word we derive the English word metamorphosis. Okay, metamorphosis is a particular word that is similar to the word change, but it is more than just change. So if you look at the definition of that term metamorphosis, it says in the dictionary, a change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one by natural or supernatural means. So that's kind of a generic definition of it. But the idea of metamorphosis is that something or someone goes through a transformation or transfiguration, right, that gives a different form, okay, whether by natural or supernatural means, okay. Now, I need to mention at this point in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, it says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. Okay? So this passage describes the humility of Jesus, right, that is tied to uh, his coming in the flesh, right? And, and that is described as emptying himself. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men in the flesh. Okay, so there's a lot here that I don't have time today to really get, get in, to go into. But the idea of emptying himself is really has something obviously to do with him coming in the flesh, or I could, I could, I could kind of describe it this way. Putting God, the holy God, okay, who transcends time and space, he, 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 he dwells uh, above, right, his creation. He's not part of it. But, and yet, he, he chooses to come into his creation, right? I mean, the purpose, we all know what the purpose is. But he does that, and the only way he can do that. And I'm going to mention the other one a little bit more later on. But we see, we do see in the Old Testament, before Jesus came into flesh, we see uh, God appearing, right? Appearings of God uh, to mankind uh, in many situations, actually. The term that is used for that idea is called theophany, okay? Theophany or Christophany. Okay? It's a term that means God right? Coming in some physical form, that's, that's what it means, right? Theophany. And we see a lot of theophany. Sometimes he comes in the form uh, that looks like a, a person, 
right? And that is referred to as, in certain situations, like uh, angel of the Lord, right? That is a theophany. Uh, the fourth person in, in the fiery furnace, okay, who is that? Uh, that is a theophany or Christophany. God appearing to Moses uh, as a form of what? A burning bush. Okay, that's not a person, but it's some, something that is, that is physical. There's a reason for that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. But when, when God the Son comes in flesh, he has to be, right, like have a, some kind of a physical appearing. And, of course, there's a reason why he came in the, in, in the form of a man, right, that has uh, very, very important significance in the redemption of man. But he does so. And so what, what's going on here is that he did not cease to become God. And we covered this point before. It is very important for Christians to believe this very, very important doctrine that God, the Son, Jesus Christ, when he came in the flesh, did not cease to become God. He was fully God still. And yet at the same time, he was fully man. Remember that a few weeks ago? We, uh, we covered that. Um, and that is a very important point. However, the fully glorious God needed to be veiled. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> okay. And so a few reasons why that was necessary. But uh, coming in the flesh uh, was a veil of the glorious, the fullness of the glorious God. Okay. So that's what we're seeing here in Philippians. As uh, Paul really is emphasizing his humility and then he exhorts, right, the disciples and the believers to uh, take on that same mind of humility, okay? And from his veiling in the flesh, who, looks, who looked just like everybody else, right? He didn't stand out in any particular way. Um, but at this point, when... He took his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and went to this mountain, and uh, he, he was transfigured, right? Something changed at that time, okay? Something changed. In Matthew's account, he says, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Okay, what does Luke say in Luke 9.29? It says, and as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. Okay, altered. And then, and his, and his, and his clothing became dazzling white. How about Mark? In chapter 9, verse 3, it says, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white. And I love this description at the end. He says, as no one on earth can, could bleach them. <laughs> okay. So I'm talk, we're talking about white. And I was reminded I was, as I was reading that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, anything that's white. Some of you ain't wearing white. But that's not white, white. It has some tint to it. Because if you put it next to something that is truly white, it will almost appear like, tan almost. Some of you think you're, you're proud of your white teeth. Put it next to something that is white, white. Your teeth will appear yellow, okay? So it's like when you compare it that way, and so that's kind of what they're describing, right? It's like, each because each one, they're perceiving the same thing, but they describe it in a different way. And so it gives us kind of a, you know, uh, the more descriptions we, we hear, right, and we think about it, it gives us a little bit richer understanding of what that was like for them, right? But <clears throat> let us stick with uh, Matthew's account. His face was shining like the sun. I mean, come on. Have you ever looked at the sun midday? By the way, never do it. You'll ruin your eyes <laughs> because it is so, so bright, and he says his face was shining like the sun. And his clothes was like light. Dazzling white, radiant. 
You know, a similar phenomenon occurred when Moses came down from Mount Horeb after his account, encounter with the presence of God. This is in Exodus chapter 34. And this is another allusion in Matthew's gospel to the fact that Jesus is the prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy, it says, in Deuteronomy 18, in verses 15 to 19. I'll just read verse 15 where it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And there are obviously many, many references to the coming Savior, the promised Messiah. That's what the Old Testament is all about. In fact, that's what the, all of the Bible, Old and New Testament, are all about. It's about, at the, at the very center of it, is about Jesus. But Moses, who was God's prophet, and a great, great prophet, merely reflected divine brilliance. Jesus, however, he was not a prophet like Moses, like in terms of being a human prophet, but he was the son of God. And he radiated divine brilliance. He didn't just reflect, right, God's brilliance. Verse 3, it says, And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So while Jesus was transfigured, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appeared. Now, none of, none of the accounts of the Gospels uh, say anything about how they recognized them. So, you know, we could just assume that uh, they just knew it by the revelation of God. Okay, because they certainly would not have known them by, oh, I remember seeing him when I was a kid kind of a thing, right? So Moses and Elijah were two of the most important figures in the Old Testament. We see a lot of figures in the Old Testament. We'll see, we see many prophets, right? We see many of them. But these were standout, most important figures. Why? Because Moses was Israel's great law-giving prophet who led Israel out of bondage in Egypt, and Elijah was Israel's great miracle-working prophet who confounded the prophets of Baal, if you, don't, if you know that story. And together, these two prophets are the personification of the entire Old Testament. Now, we come across in the New Testament the law and the prophets, right? Right? In, in, in several occasions, we see that expression, the law and the prophets. And I, I, I think I covered this before as well. Whenever you come across that, that phrase, that we should understand that as the totality of the Old Testament. Okay, it's just talking about, it's a summary of the whole, all, the whole of New, the Old Testament. So Moses represented the law and Elijah represented the prophets. And that's why they were standout prophets and the great prophets of the Old Testament and most significant among many. Not, it hasn't anything to do with the fact that on a personal level they were better than anybody else. Right? They, it was just positions that they were called to. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, it says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse." Right? So in Malachi, he, he mentions right, those two prophets. And they were both very much connected in a significant way to Jesus, to the Messiah. Moses, he wasn't the only one, but a very particular and significant one because he represented the law. But Moses was a type of Messiah. Remember that term that I used before? A type, meaning somebody who represented, right, something else. So in the, in the Old Testament, we have 
uh, a number, we have a list of individuals who were called to a certain way of serving God, and they were types of Jesus to come, and Moses was one of them. I mean, just look at the fact, what, did, what, did, what is the main thing that, that Moses do to serve God, right, based on God's command? He didn't, really, he didn't really want to do it, but after he had left Egypt and spent 40 years, right, in the wilderness, in, in, in Midian and so forth, God called him uh, as he was kind of aging. By that time, he was around 80 years old, uh, and he called him, and he said, go back, right, go back uh, to Egypt. Because God was going to use him to, to liberate, right, free his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. So he did with uh, his brother Aaron. And so he led them out from slavery to Egypt, right? Part of the sea, well, God did, but used uh, Moses, right, to part of the sea and cross the water, wandering in the desert for 40 years, and finally ending up in uh, what God promised his people, which is the promised land of Canaan. That whole thing was actually historical people, historical events, but it is also a spiritual picture of what Jesus did spiritually with sinners who were in bondage, slavery to sin, right? Crossing the water is a picture of baptism, Wandering in the desert and finally ending in the promised land of Canaan is a picture of us ultimately ending up in heaven. And so, therefore, if you look at it from that perspective, you could, all of us can clearly see right, that Moses was a type of Jesus. Okay, once again, Deuteronomy right, 18.15, I read that uh, a little while ago. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is, from, it is to him you shall listen. Elijah, on the other hand, was a messianic forerunner. A messianic forerunner. This is what it says in Malachi 3.1 and chapter 4, 5, and 6. It says, Behold, I send my messenger. That's what a forerunner is, a messenger, right? So messenger goes before, right? So behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way for, before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to, to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Okay. And if we looked at this in a similar way at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, when it was, we were going through that passage with John the Baptist, right? he was also a forerunner. It just, he just had the last leg, okay? Finally, he received the last baton, right? And he had the privilege of not just presenting Jesus, the promised Savior who actually came right, after so many generations and centuries and finally to the world, to, the, to his people, but also he got the uh, just amazing privilege of baptizing him, right? So he was also a forerunner, as was Elijah. Jesus was the Messiah. Okay. He was a greater lawgiver than Moses, and Jesus was a greater miracle worker than Elijah. All right, so all the types foreshadowing of and pointing to Christ, all the uh, animal sacrifices, it was just a type and a picture, a foreshadowing. Of course, Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, right? The ultimate Lamb of God. He was the ultimate high priest. He was the ultimate everything. Verse 4 says, And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
So while Jesus was talking with the prophets, in Matthew's account, we don't know. Okay, that is not mentioned. Uh, but this is what Luke says. Okay, Luke says in chapter 9, verse 30 and 31. So these discrepancies are not contradictions, right? Uh, but they had written, recorded their account okay, in a personal way. Uh, the same person, Jesus, the same events a lot of the, you know, lot of the times, uh, but in slightly different ways because each, each gospel, they emphasize something a little bit different. Right? That's, that's the main reason why. But in Luke, in chapter 9, verses 30 and 31, it says, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. In verse 31, who, who appeared in glory, and then Luke says, and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So we get a little bit more, more information here in Luke's account. That what they were talking about was about Jesus' departure, meaning his completion, the completion of his ministry on the cross, his death and burial and resurrection before his, he ascends. Which, is, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem, right? This is where we get uh, the notion or the idea that uh, he was, Jesus was nearing the end of his ministry, right? And reaching, right? He was nearing the, the climax right, of his mission. And at this time, Peter's interjection, as he says to Jesus, Lord, it is good. So while they were talking, right, while Jesus was in this conversation with with Moses and, and Isaiah, Peter interjects. Now that right there, if you think about it, what, 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 what would, what, what's your thought on that? It's kind of like when adults are having a conversation and, you know, if we have a couple of young kids or whatever, they're just kind of, Right? indulge themselves <laughs> and they don't consider things or whatever and they just kind of right uh, say whatever ask you know mom and dad about something and interject like that how often have I seen that and of course not all the time but some parents at least they say okay sweetie can you just hold on okay mommy and daddy are talking with so and so can you wait uh, because it's, in the least, it's rude. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you really talk about it, it's a very interesting situation. And there, there's a, well, there's a kind of a reason why Peter did this, which this text really doesn't go into or explain. Okay. In terms of why he interjected and what, why he, what he said, what he said and stuff like that. So we could only kind of speculate. But sometimes speculation is a good thing because it gives us a little bit of an understanding of what is taking place. Right? And not just a random speculation, but speculation based on certain things that we already understand about whether it's a situation or the person and so forth. And we certainly, by this time, um, for most of us, we have an understanding of the kind of person that Peter was. Right? So anyways, he interjects. Right? And we can take this as something that is not appropriate and out of place with what was taking place for two basic reasons. One I already mentioned. All right, hold on. Okay, hold on. Jesus shining like the sun, okay, he is talking, having a conversation with, for goodness sakes, Moses and Elijah, right, two of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. And the reason why that is inappropriate is because of that, but also, right, what I read in regards to the Luke's account of the kind of conversation that they were having, right, Luke 9.31. They were speaking about Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, this, now this is the climax of his ministry. This is, this is the very reason why he came. This is everything, right? This is so important. And yet, here's Peter. Okay. 
Here's Peter. Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why did he say that? Well, I read some, read some commentaries, but none of the commentaries are really certain <laughs> why he said what he said. Right, but we have some idea. Okay? If we, again, go back to Mark and, and Luke, in Mark chapter 9, verse 5, it says, And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then in verse 6 it says, For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Okay? Luke 9.33, it says, And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. So what we are clear about is this. He talked about making a setting up a tent for him and, you know, Moses and Elijah. But in Mark and Luke's account, it says he didn't know what to say. He just felt like he needed to say something in that moment. (laughs) I want to be part of what's going on, so I better say something. But But more so, okay, for they were terrified. So out of this terror of the situation, now some people are different, and we're that way. For some of us, in certain situations, we just kind of fade into the background. We disappear, turn into invisible people. Others, we stick out, right? As the saying goes, like a sore thumb, right? We blurt things out. We want to be noticed. And we're all different. Peter is like that. He has always been the one to blurt out things, right? When Jesus said, you know, hey, I need to, you know, because he had revealed about his, um, his death on the cross before, Okay, not too long before this. And what did, what did he say in regards to that? It says, no, you're not going to. Remember that part? You're not going to die. And then what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. And he rebuked him. Right? And he has been that way. Peter has been that way always. Very, very vocal. That's why he was a vocal That's what made him, I mean, there are two sides to these kinds of issues, but that's what really made him a leader among the disciples, and particularly he was a vocal leader. In this case, it was not the positive side of him that came out. It was the the opposite side, and it was quite inappropriate out of his fear of this moment that it felt like I want to say something, I needed to say something, and he said something, both in Mark's and Luke's account, that he did not know what he was saying. (laughs) He just said what came out of his mouth. (laughs) It's kind of funny if you think about it, right? In this, one of the most incredible situations that any human being, right, could have witnessed, witnessed, (laughs) he says something stupid. (laughs) That is so Peter. There are certain things about Peter that we ought all of us to emulate and certain things that we ought not. This is one of them. Okay, let us not okay, uh, be like Peter in this regard. He was just clueless as to what to say. But in the fashion of his character, right, consistent with who he was, he just felt like he needed to say something. Right? But that's not where it ends. Okay? This is kind of like a small personal story within this right, transfiguration story here. In verse 5, In verse 5, it says, he was still speaking. So as Jesus was kind of, you know, finishing his conversation, he interjects himself. And as Peter was saying these things, he was still speaking when, behold, who speaks? A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then he says, Listen to him. (laughs) Okay. So while Peter was still speaking, not knowing what is coming out of his mouth, a voice out of a bright cloud interrupted his babbling. And this voice, of course, is from God the Father. And he said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
And so this terrifying voice from heaven out of the clouds confirmed that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And this actually is the central point of this transfiguration story. I mean, we have seen in other passages where Jesus himself, right, he declares who he is. And he has done that on a number of occasions. Here, somebody else is doing that. Who is that? It is the Father. All right? God the Father. This is my beloved son. And he confirms the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. And at the same time, this voice of the Father admonished Peter to listen. And so this is, you know, is a good way to, to understand it. Why? Because it, it really matters if you read it carefully, right? Uh, parts like, he was still speaking when God spoke, right? That means something, right? This, this, is the, this was the way that God the Father was both confirming who Jesus was and is, but at the same time, he was admonishing Peter for his foolishness. The bright cloud and this divine voice recall something from the distant past in Israel's history and also something from the recent past within Jesus' kingdom ministry. So the bright cloud that overshadowed them is symbolic of the cloud that covered Mount Sinai when, where God spoke to his people as well as the pillar of cloud that went before the children of Israel. Right? As you all know, the story of the Israelites that God led uh, in the wilderness for 40 years, right? And whenever there was, an, uh, there was a pillar of cloud or pillar of fire, by that, right, his people knew that there was the actual presence of God, right, in that time. So the divine voice out of the cloud repeated, does that sound familiar, by the way? If you think really, really hard towards the beginning of Matthew, okay? It's the same words that the Father repeated, which is what he, what he said out of the heavens when Jesus was being baptized. Remember that? So as was, he was baptized, right, the heavens opened. The Holy Spirit, right, descended upon him like a dove, and the voice spoke. And what did the voice say? The same thing. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, right? Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. So father was, the Father God was already well pleased with his son prior to his faithfulness in his earthly ministry because that was the beginning. And the Father was well pleased with his son now toward the completion of his ministry. And he was expressing that he was well pleased with him. But Christ's baptism and transfiguration are also linked in some other ways besides the divine voice. Because both events mark a very important turning point in the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So the baptism was the inauguration of his ministry. That was right after he got baptized. That's when his true work began. Because prior to that time, what was his work? What was his earthly work? Right? He was a carpenter, right, like his father, earthly father was. But this is the reason why he came, okay? And he was kind of ushered by none other than John the Baptist, who was the last of the forerunner prophet of the Old Testament. And Jesus, asked, asked after he was baptized uh, by this prophet, uh, he began his, his ministry. So it, it was a, the baptism was an inauguration. The transfiguration also, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, that, it wasn't the end, right? but what ended was on, on Calvary. But it, was, it marked the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Okay? Because we will notice going forward uh, that there would be a difference between what we have seen, right, 
uh, up to chapter 16 and going forward. And finally, uh, it will culminate uh, in the betrayal uh, and the judgment of men of Jesus Christ. Uh, and finally, uh, his suffering, and death, and burial on the cross. And God said, listen to him. Hey, listen. Just stay quiet. Don't say anything. And just listen to him. And we have people like that in our lives sometimes. I, sometimes I think it. Mostly I think it. But sometimes I, I uh, want to say these kinds of words. Can you just be quiet and just listen? And of course this would remind us of Moses' words to the Israelites okay. in Deuteronomy once again. It is to him you shall listen. So believers in the Old Testament, the early church, New Testament, in the case, right, uh, on this mountain with these three disciples, right, God speaking to, addressing, right, specifically Peter, uh, to the present day believers, all of us included, we are all commanded to look to, to Christ and to listen to him. And in verses 6 to 7, and this will close our, my message today. So when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were once again terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Okay, so as they witnessed Jesus' face shining like the sun, his, his clothes were radiant, right? It was whiter than white. And now they hear this voice from heaven. And so they fell on their faces and were terrified. Now, if you think about it for a moment, you may think, what's so terrifying about seeing some, somebody like bright and hearing a voice from the heaven? Um, I, I guess on one hand, we can really never know because we, we are not in that situation, right? And we will never experience that in our lifetime. But we do understand this, right, from Scripture. Going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, why in the Old Testament that God chose to make his appearance as a theophany or Christophany or through some visible material thing. Why did he do that? Well, the one, one main reason is this, right? It's something that I covered before as well uh, in regards to the temple or the tabernacle and the temple. Same thing. One is portable. The other is permanent. And at the center of the tabernacle or the temple, if you go in there, is the, the inner sanctuary, the holy of holies. Nobody can go in there, right? Only a proof person is the high priest, but only one day out of the year he is permitted, right? The day of atonement. And he has to go through a thorough uh, cleansing ceremony before he goes in there because if he does not, according to how God commanded, that in the, in the face of God, in the very immediate presence of God, he would fall to his death. It was a frightful thing. Which is the reason why, once again, I'll describe how that went, all went. So when that day came, the Day of Atonement each year, hold the, the, the high priest, you know, after his thorough ceremonial cleansing, he went in there. On one ankle, bells were tied. On the other ankle, rope was tied, extending to the outer part of right, uh, the temple. Because for some reason, if the high priest failed to do what was proper prior to going in there, when he went in there, right, he would have been dead, right, in the presence of the holy God. 
And if anybody went in there to retrieve the body, they will be dead. So no, they, everybody knew they, they couldn't go in there. That's why, you know, it's like they're listening from the outside. Okay, as long as the bells are ringing, he's still alive because he's moving around. If they didn't hear it, then they were supposed to drag the body out by pulling the rope on it. So it was a really frightful thing to be in the presence of the Holy God. Because no sinner could stand, right, being, right, in, in, in the fullness of the glorious God in his, all his radiance and his holiness. That's why he needed to veil himself, right? That's why he needed to use these objects, things, to let his people know that, okay, I am here now. So there is a reason why these disciples in that moment, so even Jesus at that time, they got a glimpse of his glorious state. Right? Because that's the description that we're given actually of Jesus Christ in Revelation. Right? Which, by the way, who wrote the Revelation? John, who was here. So they instantly, not f- good thing, they didn't fall to their death. But they were just struck with terror, and they instantly fell face down to the ground. Once again, what is that picture of? Worship, right? Their terror of God's voice was similar to the children of Israel's terror to God and his voice at Mount Horeb. Their response was also similar to when John later encountered the risen and glorified Christ in his old age as he was sent to this island of Patmos. This is the revelation that I was referring to. When I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet like as though dead. Right? So as that was going on, they're all flat on their faces in terror. Jesus came to his disciples who were lying face down and he touched them. And he told them, rise and have no fear. I mean, over and over, Jesus to the non-believers, to the, you know, most everybody. And I want to say not everyone, but most everyone. He wasn't so nice to the Pharisees and the scribes, if you recall. Okay, But for everybody else, you know, he was merciful. He was gracious. He was kind. He was uh, compassionate, okay? I mean, just think about some of the things that he had done in terms of, you know, uh, uh, curing, right? Healing of physical ailments. He didn't have to do that. But he did it for various reasons. And uh, we cannot exclude the fact that he was compassionate. Why did he feed the 5,000? I mean, they were there all day, following, thousands following him all day. There was no food, Right? And so he also demonstrated by feeding them in a miraculous way, but also he was demonstrating his compassion as well. And here, he could have just said, what are you guys doing? Just get up. But he touched them, and he said, rise and have no fear. So Jesus understood that what they had just witnessed was overwhelming and terrifying to them. And going back to why, why would he, we started out with, with, right, Jesus taking these three up to the mountain, fully knowing what would take place there. Why why did he do that? Well, this this passage really doesn't address it, nor does do the other uh, gospel accounts. But perhaps so that they would have a more complete understanding of who, who he was because of, of their ministry that was ahead of them. So they were headed, after Jesus uh, completed his ministry all right, by dying on the cross, being buried and, 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 and resurrected uh, from the grave, and after he ascended, uh, who continued the, mis- the same ministry, the apostles, the disciples did. But them, particularly because of the particular 
uh, task that they were given to lay down the foundation of the church. And, you know, Jesus already knew, with the exception of John, um, you know, who was kind of cast out, right, to the, live the rest of his life uh, in the secluded island of Patmos. But everybody else, all the other disciples, what happened to them? Well, they did what they needed to do faithfully to, to uh, do the gospel ministry. And at the end of their lives, they were all martyred, right? They were crucified. And some say Peter was crucified upside down by church uh, tradition. Uh, some were beheaded. I mean, they were all killed. It was a very, very difficult. I mean, what did Paul experience? All kinds of stuff. So Jesus knew what was ahead of them. So perhaps, right, perhaps that they would have a more complete understanding of view of who he was right, in order to help them to have this conviction to remain faithful to the Messiah and to the work of the gospel especially during the difficulties that they would face in their life. And this unforgettable event had a tremendous impact on these three disciples. And we know this because in their later years, both John and Peter wrote about this moment. And I've referenced this uh, particularly in John chapter 1, verse 14, numerous times. So what does John say in chapter 1, verse 14? And the word became flesh. Well, first thing he says is, Right? And uses the same language as the Genesis, right? Chapter 1, verse 1, by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and Word was with God, and Word was God. But in verse 14, it says, And this Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Nobody else can really say that. I mean, they could say it, but not in a, not in a way that John, Peter, and, uh, John and James and Peter would say it. We have seen his glory. We saw his face shining like the sun. It's kind of, you know, how we should understand this. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And what does Peter say in 2 Peter 1, chapter, uh, verse 16 and 8 to 18? For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when, we, when he received honor and glory from the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice from, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. There was a, this was... That this experience was emblazoned on their hearts, in their minds. So I'm certain of it, that all three carried this to the very end of their lives. And once again, Jesus touched them as they were face down on the ground in terror. He touched them and he told them to get up and to not fear. And they opened their eyes at that point and they looked up and they saw no one except Jesus. And if I was one of them, it would have been like, was that real or <laughs> did, did we just imagine it, right? Did we just pass out for a little bit and, and just imagine these things? But everything had returned to normal at that point. But yet, what Peter, James, and John had witnessed had forever impacted them to their core, in their core. To this point, they had heard Jesus preach and teach about the kingdom, as I said in the beginning. They had witnessed him perform many signs and wonders. They had recently heard him acknowledge his identity as the Christ, the anointed one. Now, they had just dramatically experienced Jesus as God's son and the glorious king in the glorious radiance of who God is. Peter, James, and John were certainly privileged to have witnessed this glorious transfiguration of Jesus. 
none of the others had. No other Christians, believers had, have, none of us will have in our life. And this happened to them, likely to solidify in their hearts and minds that he was indeed the Son of God without a doubt, especially in light of what they were facing in their ministry and life. Jesus was the Son of God. He was the promised Savior, the Messiah who had come. He was the King of kings and Lord of lords. He was divine. Lastly, I want to ask all of you this question. What is your view of Jesus? Not having witnessed the same, what is your view of Jesus? None of us, as I said, have seen the the glorious transfiguration of Jesus, and none of us will in our life. Does that mean that we should have a lesser view and understanding of him? Or what struggles of life do you face or have you faced that would take your focus off of your glorious Savior and Lord? Because that happens often, actually. Whenever we go through trials and tribulations, struggles of life, what always happens is that we get focused on our troubles. And when that happens, our view of our Savior and Lord become diminished. And the only way that we can maintain the proper view without diminishing who Jesus is, without diminishing the promises of God, is to constantly seek him through the word and relentlessly cling to Jesus with our faith. In John chapter 20, verses 26 to 29, it says, eight days later his disciples were inside again And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Because this was after his resurrection. So he was literally walking through closed doors. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. All right, this is a story of Thomas. What was his thing? Well, I'm not going to believe until I put my finger in his, you know, nail-pierced hand and so forth, right? Because he was not believing the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. In verse 28, it says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Okay. Ah, Okay. You have proven to me. (laughs) And then what does Jesus say in verse 29? Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And we've covered this point before. I mean, Jesus, over and over and over, not just his incredible teachings, right, but signs, right, these wonders, these miracles. But no, nobody comes to believe on, 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 on the basis of what they have seen, right? That is not the nature of faith, right? And so that's what Jesus is saying. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, I do understand Christians of why they, you know, a lot of Christians make it a big thing, you know, to visit Israel and other places in Palestine where Jesus lived and walked and so forth. I understand historically, right, to be there and kind of imagine things, right, according to our understanding of what, you know, how Jesus lived and his ministry and so forth. But on the other hand, I think we still have to be careful about those things, right? We cannot be so, right, too into those things, right? As if, like, well, it's, you know, kind of like people saying, you know, it, 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 like they, we make a church building and call it a church and have some, you know, notion that perhaps because this building is called church, it has a cross on it and so forth, 
right, and, and, and you know, decorated in a certain way, this is somehow a little bit more holier than the parking lot or the park, right? And we often, a lot of times, a lot of Christians uh, 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 call right, church buildings, they call it God's house. And we have to be really careful about how we think about such things because we, we really, uh, not rejecting, but it's more like diminishing what Christ achieved. We're kind of going backwards in terms of how the Old Testament saints used to live because that was how God commanded them to live. I will be here when you see a pillar of cloud, Pillar of, night, I mean, pillar of fire by night, then you know I'm here kind of thing. Or set, set up a tabernacle, right, and this is where I'll meet you, give you my word and so forth, right? A particular place and time and so forth. But all those things were abolished, right? They were all pointing to Christ and Christ came. Do you think your, your faith would like tremendously take a leap of growth if Jesus appeared to, to us right here in front of us physically? I think in the, I mean, what I can say is, we, I don't know, we might fall on our faces like Peter, James, and John in terror. First of all, is because even though we might imagine that it's a, a glorious experience, if that actually happened, we would all freak out. It's like seeing a ghost, like the disciples, right? They were out in the choppy waters, the wavy waters, right, in, in, in the sea, and Jesus was walking on water in the nighttime. It was like, uh, they thought they saw a ghost. I don't know. Maybe that's what it would be like. But I don't see anywhere. So something like that kind of an experience will cause our faith to grow. That is not what faith is. First Peter 1 8 and 9, it says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is the essence of faith. To believe as if it were right before our faces, right? That is the nature of faith. We do not see Jesus. None of us have physically. After Jesus died, buried, was buried and resurrected and ascended from heaven, at, from that moment on, no believer saw Jesus. So it was a particular time that we could still say, yes, the disciples and other believers were privileged to be there in the physical presence of Jesus as he came in the flesh. But that, that, that does not mean that the rest of us are not privileged. We are privileged in the same way through our faith. We believe Jesus whom we have not seen. We will not see him. But we believe in him. And we also rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Why? Because this invisible Jesus to our physical eyes is who he says he was and is and will be. He is the one whom the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this is our Savior and Lord who is returning to take us into glory. And lastly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 to 7, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And this is the point of a lot of our failures, failings, and our struggles is that because we have a tendency of living by sight and not by faith. And brothers and sisters, perhaps 
it will do us well to live with our eyes closed more often <laughs> because what we see oftentimes do not help us. <laughs> so I do understand, right? Uh, it's not God's command when we pray to close our eyes, by the way. <laughs> right? It's just a typical practice. Right? It's mostly practical because we don't get distracted by the things that we see. But in general, this is true. We live with our eyes open, right? Please, when you drive, keep your eyes open. And we do all kinds of things with our eyes open. But unfortunately, what comes through our eyes often become distractions to our faith. I pray that in this new year, that we live with less distractions of this world and more intensely focused on the glorious Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us pray. Father, thank you for blessing us at this time with your word. And these words of yours, not only true, but they are life. They are strength. They are our guide, our hope, our everything. Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit to live closely with your heart, uh, with your word uh, in our hearts and in our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.